You want the name? Yeah. Janitor Franklin. I was born in 1930. My parents were Wolford Franklin and Nelly Nail Johnson Franklin. And they was they kept us kept us fed and kept us working. Yeah. When you got big enough to work, well, they put us out there working. Hello, I'm Tim Barnwell, and thanks for watching The Face of Appalachia. Chancer said to me, you can take the man out of the mountains, but you can't take the mountains out of the man. Across two visits to his farm in the Shelton Laurel section of Madison County, one thing is for sure. It's especially true of this 94-year-old. You can no more take the mountains out of him as you could take them out of western North Carolina. Having driven his steep and winding driveway on two occasions, once in five inches of snow and another in nicer weather, I realized that even by a country mile, Jancer's place is remote. But what struck me the most is how happy he is to live there and how little he needs from the outside world. Through hard work and perseverance, Jancer has been able to support himself and his family on a steep mountaintop piece of land by farming, sawmilling, and raising livestock. He lives a simple life, rarely traveling more than a few miles from home, and is more than satisfied with that, not feeling the need for more. When I told a friend I was going to visit Janser, her face lit up and she launched into a story about visiting his farm with her husband to buy beans and the great experience they had there. Indeed, everyone I talked to about him had a similar reaction, and after spending time with him, I can see why. He is a special person, gentle, humble, and honest, with a wealth of knowledge about farming and a twinkle in his eye. It's been an honor to get to know him, and I think you'll feel the same way after spending time with us on his farm and hearing stories from his life. Well, welcome in, my friend. Come on in. What did your parents do? Were they farmers? Farming and sawmilling, raising cattle. That's, that's practically our whole life. Yeah. And we, Farmed all their life. So what all did you raise on the farm? Tobacco, corn, beans. Used to raise these your selling beans, we call them out there. Put out about a half acre, acre. Pick them, take them to the cannery down there at uh, Newport. Yeah. How many brothers and sisters did you have? Four brothers, no sisters. Are any of them still living? Two of us. Next to the oldest and the youngest. But which are you? Are you the youngest? No, no. I'm next to the oldest. <laughs> yeah. My brother, he he killed himself. By Caden, my dad and mother passed away. He just got to where he couldn't make it. <laughs> and I went over I was one found him. He just lived across the hill over here. And me and him, was, we always worked together. He had something that he couldn't do. He'd get me, and if I had something I couldn't do, I'd get him, and we just worked together on the farm. Do you remember your grandparents? Yeah. My two grand, grandparents. I told him I was lucky and should be thankful of it. My two grandies and my two grandpas, they both, both said they never, never lived as long as I have now. They died younger. Guess it was a harder life back then, wasn't it? Yeah. Hard life to, to pull through it. When you were growing up, what time would you get up in the morning? Kind of what would you start? How would you start your day? Well, we, most of the time about the break of day. Get, get in or need a good breakfast. Then whenever we got out and milked the cows and fed, then we'd, we'd hit the field. Yeah. That's, that's about the... About the earliest we'd get up. 
and in bedtime, after we suffered sat around the wall there and he wanted us all to go to bed there so we could get our sleep so we could get up early. Yeah. Did you go to school when you were growing up? Went to the fifth grade. Stayed in there three years. Didn't get to go enough to learn that. I told my dad, I said, I if I don't get to go no more than that, there ain't no use for me going back. So I quit. But I didn't get to go enough to, enough to stay with the books to learn nothing. Yes, they need you on the farm more? Mm -hmm. They needed you working on the farm? Yeah. Needed us more on the farm, seemed like. Some of the teachers told them that they ought to put us in school and put us through school and we could have got a better job. But I wasn't cut out for a job. I told him I liked the dirt too good. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd rather farmers be on it there. The, the job I told me sure is every morning you had to head in the same old thing of going to work. Now here you could go to plow one day, you can. They go eat the next you can to use a different job doing the farm. Janser and his wife Roxy had three children, Ricky, Brenda, and Karen. In the late 1970s, he began farming a piece of land that he had bought from his uncle Schuyler that sat just across a mountain from his original home place. At first they would just come over each day to farm, but soon made a temporary structure to stay in while there and began building their new home. The two oldest children had moved away at that point, but his youngest daughter, Karen, lived in the new house with her parents starting in 1979. On both my visits with Janser, Karen was staying with him, and it was fun to be able to hear her stories about growing up on the farm. All the farmland was this, in this section of the farm, so um, he built a little uh, place that we could be back if the storm came when we were farming, you know, we'd have a place to get inside. Um, at that time, there wasn't a barn. Um, just a, you know, a, a small barn um, with cattle. So we had a place to um, they put a little cook stove, so a little wood stove, so we could fix our meals when we were back. And um, so it became easier to to be back here since there was the cattle and the farming. Um, and it was fun at first. We thought it was like camping. Mm -hmm. So um, then he decided to move back. I think it was the the day that I got out of fourth grade. We were back here for the summer, and the summer ended up being a little bit longer. And <laughs> <laughs> so it became permanent. <laughs> so, um, but like I said, it was fun at first until we had to, we didn't have a road going out back down to the Highway 212. So we had to walk down to the store to catch the school bus. This is the uh, first original room of the little house that we were talking about. Um, this is all that's still standing. There were two more, uh, three rooms, two more. So we lived in basically two rooms until they got the house built. Tell me a little bit about your wife, where you met, how long you were married, that kind of thing. Yeah. You might have to hit me on that. <laughs> My first cousin and his wife wanted us to come over and one evening I had to play games. And I went over I that's when we first met. Went over I'd to play games. I told him I'll play the game and got myself into it. <laughs> Sixty seven years. 62, Seven. 67 years. Yeah, and we got to going together there then and we married then. 
together 60, 67 years. And some of them actually said, how in the world did you get by that long? And I told them whenever I got an argument, I'll tell you, I'd be a hat and run. <laughs> Jasser has farmed his entire life, first on his parents' place and later on his own 65-acre tract on top of the mountain where he lives today. We had a great conversation about clearing land to farm, raising corn and other crops, what they grew to eat and what they had to buy, and he relates a fascinating story about the peddler truck that used to come by once a week with supplies including coal oil used in kerosene lamps. We didn't have enough land over on that side to put the corn and everything out. And so he bought one back on Listenville. You ever, you ever know where Listenville is? Yeah. Just over across the mountain here, we, we raised the corn over there and cleared the mountains and planted the corn in it and raised corn. Of course, I wasn't big enough at that time to to help him pull the cross cut or nothing, but my brother was. You know what the cross cut is? Yeah. <laughs> they use that to clear all the trees? The yeah. Hand? Yeah. And my dad, me and my oldest brother, we we saw the trees down out of the way by the pine, pine ticket. We pulled out our cross cut saw them there. If we'd had the Power saws like we've got now, they wouldn't have been no timber. It'd be all cut down. I guess that's true, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And we'll go to the mountains and it's all grown up this year. Have you ever been on spill corn? Mm -hmm. Now we get back on spill corn, look back this way, right back to the top of the mountain there. Clear enough to where we can make our bread corn. And then we never got the corn made in in, I see, October. October, there'd come a big frost or two, and we go back there and haul it in now with a sled, mule and sled. Go back there and take it. So we went back there and gathered it. And the mule couldn't pull the full sled up to the top of the mountain. It was just about a half a sled. We'd bring it up there and turn it over and then go back and get another. And it's, it's getting down late in the evening when we got off in there. But I was like I told this girl around here, I was back in the good old days. <laughs> but she didn't believe it that way. And we'd, we'd raise corn for two to three years in it. God. Didn't have no fertilizer to put on it. Uh, Jim Shelton, there's an old man up here on the creek there. He lived at the Batik place at that time. He took his little mule and a sled and pulled 200 pound of fertilizer. Had it in 200 pound bags. He pulled it up there on the back side up there. He rented it from Dad. And he said, Wolfer said, I'm going to show you how to make corn. Did you need some fertilizer on it? And Dad told him, said, Jim said, I ain't got the money to buy the fertilizer. Well, Jim, he put fertilizer on it. And Dad, he didn't have the money to put on it. And Dad, he had them big ears of corn, 12 inches or longer. <laughs> I'd fall to them and said, I'll tell you what, this year ground don't need the fertilizer. But he put the fertilizer on, but he didn't make that good of corn. Back in them Buckeye cold out of the way where your leaves is rotted on it and everything, it'd make good corn two years to three years. Just it's the same as you put fertilizer on it. So what did you have to buy at the store? It sounds like you made almost everything on the farm. Uh, well, the coffee and sugar and flour. that we didn't grow that much wheat to flour. Coffee and sugar and flour, that's about the, and soda, that's about what 
what you have to buy out of the stores. And we had them uh, rolling trucks, they called them, peddler trucks. And we had uh, Everett Rice out here, you might have known him before. Next to Walnut, or he'd come through once a week. You got what, what you need to open him. And I'd, I'd help like everything. So what all would he have on his truck? It's like going into a store. Whatever you need, he had it. And if he didn't have it this week, he'd have it next week. You can tell him what you need and he'd bring it? Well, you know, if you ask him about something like that and he didn't have it that day, the next week he'd have it. Yeah. And he'll he a good about it that way. Coal oil, had him a barrel of coal oil right on the back of the truck. On the outside, you get your coal oil dog. Yeah. Just, just rolling stores, what they call him. Yeah, he, and my mother, she had taken, raised his chicken up to about two and three pounds. And the peddler, he had, he had, we called him the peddler truck. And he'd buy them chickens from them. And that way he could get her sugar and lard and stuff with it. Do y'all have a lot of chickens? Yeah. Yeah, we always kept chicken there and they kept us an egg. If you want one to eat then you had them to eat. Yeah, them my mother she was she was a worker. She kept them chickens there and set them our hens and she'd bring them our little enough about three Three to four pound anyway, tell them the peddler truck might do. Yeah. I gravy, I guess, is what brought me through. <laughs> gravy and cornbread and, and biscuits. Of course, my mother, she's always fixed plenty of sweets out of way, and I've, I've been a sweetening hand. Jelly and applesauce, biscuits, little butter to go with them. You can't beat that. Kept her busy making gravy and cooking taters first. There's five of us, boys, and then her and my dad. Seven in the family. She didn't have a whole lot of help. They'd leave me to help her a lot of times. So did you learn how to make biscuits then? Yeah. When you were young? Yeah. There's some from Pennsylvania there. He, I, I said biscuits most of the time, spoon bread, we call it. Just stir it up, it's good and thick. And just take a spoonful at a time, make your biscuits. Yeah, drop biscuits, we call them. Yeah, my mother's here. You got sick there, and my dad, he got Everett Johnson to go over on the spill corn, haul a load of corn around one fall. And my mother was sick, she couldn't, couldn't get out of the bed there. And, but she'd tell me what to, what to put in the, the tater soup. And that man come out and said, one of my first cousins lived across the road there, and she said, bud, get the dinner over with. She'd come down there and make a pan of biscuits. So she'd come down there and make a pan of biscuits, and they brought the corn over. And he went in there and ate dinner with it, and he asked that girl, said, I want the recipe of that tater soup. She said, that's the best tater soup that I've eaten yet. And she called me Hoot. She said, you have to see Hoot about that, that he's the one who made that. But he said he had never eaten tater soup like that. I had the pepper laid to it and put it in the Yeah. So I, I told my other girl that she didn't help. <laughs> I worked back at the mountain there and it took her about uh, 
anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes to walk back to the field. We took her to a gallon of milk. We had a good cold spring there, and we took that gallon of milk down in there and uh, took a bunch of cornbread and onions or either biscuits and fruit. Either one of them done good. And we took him back there and we'd go ahead and set the milk in the spring and we'd work at 12. And dinner time, it, it didn't come quick enough. Yeah, we uh, worked that corn out and then they come dinner time in, we, we got our milk and bread and and sometimes uh, biscuits. My mother, she would make him a cat head biscuit, I call them. Fill them full of fruit. And come dinner time, well, growing up, we couldn't hardly wait to come dinner time. It seemed like it never come. And so, time we get out there, it's gonna be quitting time. And by the time we come from over there, and the sun had gone down, getting down the door. But, but we made it. Would your mama have supper ready right when you got home? She have a cow's milk and a pan of cornbread. The pan was about that wide, or maybe a little wider, and about that long she had it that thick. Big onion head. A lot of times, soup bean. I might make you hungry. <laughs> we're just sat down and eat us a big supper. Get in there and talk a while, and then we'd, we'd lay down and go to bed. Next morning, we'd get up and go again. It's a hard life to live back in, but if you work hard, Eating good, that's what made the difference. You can get out there and work, make it then. As we wound down our visit with Janser, he shared a story about his barn burning down and how his neighbors pitched in to build a new one. While he reflects on the past, he continues to look forward, having already tilled a field to plant this year's garden. And with the support of family and friends, Janser is able to live as he always has, working in the dirt. Over here in the in that level spot there. Had a log born there. And I had had it full of hay and then the farm tools and things in it. I had two sheds on each side. And it got burnt down. The cattle had them in there and fast they run right back up on the ridge down there belling and things and the mules both. And the neighbors come and asked me what they planned to do, and I told them, well, the, the cattle, I could sell them off, but I had a backer crop there and had this field out over here and in back here. I said, if we just get a place to put the backer in, I could sell the cattle. One of my neighbors come up and he said, no, he said, you don't sell your cattle. I said, we got enough hay to, to winter them through. So after we got the barn bell here, my neighbor down on the creek here, he brought a hundred bales of hay, pulled up here to take care of the cattle. And I had a neighbor up on the mill creek. He said, I've got a barn of hay up there. You just come up there and get it, get your cattle through. My neighbor, they come in here and have to get it built back. They were the 33 here helping me look back. Just working like bees, old and young and all. Really hit me out. You can't be good friends. Yeah. When I was younger, we would go to church, and on Sundays, we would stop by my uh, grandmother's and grandfather's house, mom's dad's mom and dad, and uh, she always had fried potatoes, pinto beans, cornbread. That was every Sunday meal, and oh, it was so good. That 
one particular Sunday, she had green beans. And when you went in their front door, you could make a circle and come back through the bedroom. And, you know, it was like an add-on. So it was like a loop. And I met <laughs> Dad at the front door and I said, come on, Granny, don't have a thing for me to eat. <laughs> so she said, as long as I'm alive, you will always have pinto beans, fried potatoes, and cornbread if you ever come to my house. And I did. I she That was just her meal. If she had other stuff, she always had that. Dad and I would walk the farm, you know, and him being working in logging and, you know, the trees, he, he taught me the, like, the different bark and the what to look for and the, you know, the, like, the hickory nuts or acorns or whatever, you know, the, to tell the trees, the leaves, the difference in the oak trees and the stuff. And we would go um, look for ginseng. He showed me what that was, you know, what it looked like. Um, but we, we just, you know, that was, that was fun. That was what I enjoyed doing. So you come and help with your dad now? I do. Um, I'm blessed to get to to stay with him. You know, dad's pretty self-sufficient. He can cook and we taught him how to do his own laundry, that kind of thing. But it gets lonesome, I'm sure. Um, he and mom were together 67 years and that's a long time to have somebody and then be by yourself so um i'm blessed to have a understanding husband that says you know you need to spend time with your dad now and hopefully we'll have the rest of our lives together when, but um i would come and help with mom stay some with her um probably the last couple years of her life um we would take turns staying and uh but I, I'm here probably 75% of the time now with Dad, so. We're just, it's old farmers is all you can say about it. And then sawmillers, we'd catch up with the farm and then we'd go to the sawmill. Did you like farming? Is that why you stayed? Yeah, that was my life for farming. So have you traveled much away from here or you mostly stayed on the farm? Stayed in the mountains all the time. <laughs> I ain't traveled that much. I wasn't cut out to be a traveler. Yeah, we just been on the farm. Well, ever since got big enough to help my dad, I've been on the farm. I ain't been, been, been off. Maybe work a, about a couple of weeks or three in the biker warehouse of the fall that away, but other than that, they just done on the farm and stayed with it. I always told them you take a man out of the mountains, but you can't take a mountain out of the man. About that's the true story. Supper in a few. I think he's doing it. <laughs> there you go. Is that what you want? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. What you need? You did all the cheese. Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> On this channel, I hope to continue to honor the people, vibrant culture, and strong traditions of Appalachia. If you share my interest in the people and places I call home, be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons to learn more about this way of life. So you gonna put a garden in this year? Yeah, I've got 
one plowed up or, or hoping to. Yeah. I said most 94 year olds don't worry about them. I like to get out there and play in the dirt. So what are you going to plant? I'm going to put the beans and corn and the okras. I want some of them squash, cucumbers. What's that? I said, what you think these older, those older people would think about nowadays just call, calling up and ordering your food and having it delivered to the door? They wouldn't believe you. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, no they more than they'd be believe you could walk around with a phone no. in your hand. And, no. Well, they didn't even know no. where the telephone was. No. You couldn't make them believe that. No. Mm.